All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Kevin Jark, and I'm the Regional Crops and Soils Educator for Outagamie and Winnebago Counties, and I'd like to welcome you to the ninth Badger Crop Connect webinar of 2023. I'll be your host today. The Badger Crop Connect series aims to provide timely crop updates for producers and agricultural professionals in Wisconsin and throughout the growing season, and is jointly sponsored by the UW-Madison Division of Extension Crops and Soils Program and the UW uh, Nutrient and Pest Management Program. As a recipient of federal funding, UW Extension must collect information about its outreach efforts. As a part of your registration for this event, we requested that you provide your demographic information. All information collected is anonymous and cannot be tracked back to you. Thank you for your assistance and uh, we will get started soon. While many of you are familiar with our virtual presentations in the Zoom platform, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items. Please keep your microphones muted and videos off during the webinar. The mute and video controls are on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Also, please feel free to type questions for our presenters into the chat box at any time. The chat button is in the center, is in the bottom center of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can as time allows. If you have any questions or difficulties with Zoom technology, you can type your questions into the chat or alternatively, you can email Sam Bibby, so sam.bibby, B-I-B-B-Y, at wisc.edu, or you can call Sam at 608-219-2055 if you are having difficulties. So before we get started here to, to move on to our two keynote presentations, I simply wanted to uh, share some slides here real quickly. And uh, this is from an event that was hosted in O'Connell County, uh, working with Scott Royce. You can see him in the upper uh, left-hand corner there. And one of the great things about extension work is we have state specialists who are willing to travel from Madison and come and join us out in the field. Uh, as you uh, make your way around the photos there, Moving uh, to the right, you can see a blue tent. Uh, and on the right corner of that blue tent, you see an individual with a pretty uh, well-established beard there. And we're gonna be hearing from uh, him today. And so this was an event that's focused on winter wheat as well as uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and technology. And again, you can see Damon Smith in the lower uh, right-hand corner as well as a crowd in the following one. The reason I bring this up is that while Extension aims to uh, have the boundaries of the uh, campus be the boundaries of the state, it's not just about getting out, it's about putting information and meetings together in a form that farmers can use. Field days are great. Here's an example of a recent twilight meeting that we hosted uh, regionally in Outagamie County. And uh, as you can see there, we've got a uh, private sector individual, Todd Schomburg with us, and he's sharing information about corn silage dry down. And here you can see one of the folks you'll be hearing from today, Joe Lauer, and I know that the slide that he's got up in the screen in this photo is something he'll be, be chatting about here uh, with us today as well. So real quickly, uh, hopefully those of you who are planning on attend have, a, have registered for the Agronomy Soils uh, Research Field Day at Arlington Research Station. The request was August 17th. However, I believe that if we still have people who want to attend, uh, that may still be a possibility. And I simply threw out this last slide because I know Joe is going to talk about corn silage dry downs. And I wanted to share an example of what uh, our forage council does. I think we have a number of forage councils and local co-ops or private partners that will be hosting events similar to this uh, during this growing season. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to ask for our first presenter, Joe Lauer, uh, to go ahead. He can start, start sharing here. Joe Lauer is our corn agronomist representing UW-Madison and Division of Extension. Joe is going to be discussing corn silage harvest, nitrates, and storage. Joe? Thank you, Kevin. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, what I was asked to talk to you about today was just kind of where we're at with this year's uh, corn silage crop. And as we head into harvest, some of the things to be thinking about a little bit about nitrates and storage. And um, one of the things that we're also seeing this year is that in many areas, um, there is some issues with um, uh, 
uh, pollination and also just grain development in the crop. And I want to talk a little bit about how we might uh, think about getting at the value of this if there's some real problems with either stand establishment or poor pollination. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit a little bit later. All right. Well, um, as far as um, you know, in season uh, decisions that need to be made with corn silage, there's at some point during the season where yield just kind of goes out the window. And once that happens, what we're really trying to do is, is harvest that crop at the correct moisture so that we can ensile it, get it, get it through fermentation and preserve it so that we can be feed it out over the next year or so uh, uh, to either dairy cattle or, or, uh, or beef, some sort of livestock. One of the first things to do, and these are just some guidelines I'm gonna work through, I'm gonna come back and show you the underlying data of this. But one of the first things to do is note hybrid maturity and planting data of the fields that you intend for silage. Oftentimes though, <laughs> the, the field that gets ended up harvested for silage is oftentimes not managed optimally for silage. It's ones that went through a lot of stress or, or there's a lot of issues with those fields, late planted, lots of things that can happen. And those are typically the ones that go in. But if you know the hybrid maturity, know the planting date, that's what, kind of the first step. The next step is really to note the, the tasseling or silking date. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more. But if you know that date, uh, typically about 42 to 47 days after silking is when the uh, grain is at about 50% kernel milk. Now that doesn't finalize the, the ending moisture there, but it gives you a sense of where you're at um, developmentally. Um, and just by noting that tasseling day, that's, a, that's one of the key things to do. Uh, another thing is to, after that kernel milk line begins to move, uh, there are various, what I just call triggers to kind of time when corn silage harvest should begin. But, but a good thing to do at that, once that milk line starts to move, is to get a moisture estimate of that field. And I'll talk a little bit about how to sample that field and, and things like that to, to, to handle some of the variability that might be in the field. But by using a half a percent dry down per day, we can then predict uh, when a field might be ready for the particular storage structure that you're trying to put that corn silage into. And then as a final check, um, prior to chopping, you can also take a moisture measurement, but as you're in the field cutting, you can also adjust that cutter height a little bit to move that moisture up to somewhere between two to four points uh, as that chopper is moving through the field. And these are all things that can be used to time this harvesting. And again, yield is not the important thing here. What's important now or coming up will be getting that right moisture for the storage structure that's out there. I mentioned that that, um, that we really don't worry too much, or we, we, we use 42 to 47 days after silking as the, as the um, uh, timing uh, of when to get, to get to about half milk line. The difference in relative maturity among hybrids within Wisconsin, if you look at a 90 day versus 110 day, hybrid, and you look at the reproductive period or the grain filling period, that grain filling period is pretty much the same regardless of relative maturity. There's a little bit of range in there, but it's typically about 55 to 60 days. The difference in these uh, relative maturity values is really during the vegetative stage where 110 or a longer season hybrid will have 21 to 23 leaves, whereas a 90 day hybrid will have 15 to 17 leaves. And this difference, usually it's about a two, every leaf takes about two to three days to emerge. And, um, and this difference is really the difference that we see then in terms of relative maturity. But the key thing here for silage harvest is that the grain filling period is typically about the same. And we can use this 42 to 47 days as a initial target for when silage harvest might occur. The other thing about about timing this harvest a little bit is, is to know this kernel milk stage trigger as to when to go out and do your first 
moisture dry down. And of course, this depends on the, on the kind of structure you're putting the corn silage into, but a horizontal bunker, you're looking at 70 to 65% moisture content. A bag is a little bit wider range, about 70 to 60. Upright concrete save, stave silo is 65 to 60. And an oxygen limiting silo is about 60 to 50% moisture. But if you use these triggers over here, once that kernel milk stage is at about 80%, um, from the 20% down from the crown, and there's about 80% from the crown to the tip that's still in kernel milk, um, then that silage is more than likely going to be too wet. But you'll know where that moisture is. And then if you know that moisture, you can use that half a percent dry down per day to kind of predict where you need to be to harvest for that structure. So let's just say you're putting corn into a um, horizontal bunker. You go out and measure the moisture of that silage at the 80% kernel milk stage, and you find out that it's about 74% moisture. Well, at a half percent dry down per day, that means that you could start filling that bunker about eight days later. 74 minus 70 would be about four percentage points, about a half a percent per day. So you're looking at about eight days until that particular field is ready for harvest. Again, these values here are gonna to be too wet, but you'll know um, kind of where you're at with that field and that'll help you make a better decision as to timing that. Joe, before that we go, I hate to interrupt, but there's a, a question that's very pertinent here. Um, does severe hail damage more than 75% defoliation speed up or slow down maturity or have minimal impact on the maturing process? Yeah, anytime you have a stress that goes on within plants, um, typically all everything I'm saying goes out the window. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say that, but, but uh, sometimes some hybrids react differently than other hybrids. Um, in general, I would say that more than likely what you're going to have is, is that crop with hail damage probably drying faster than um, you would with uh, just, a, just a regular crop because you're basically damaging the, um, you're, 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 you're removing some leaves, but the driest part of a corn silage, of a, of a corn plant when you're timing harvest is the grain part of that. That grain is still gonna be there, stalks are wetter, um, but I would, I would think that, that that grain will probably dry a little bit faster uh, than, the whole, than a regular whole plant, regular silage. And, um, and so it, it's probably gonna be a little bit quicker. But again, whenever you, you have these kinds of stresses, um, it, it really, uh, any kind of recommendation goes out the window because of, of the hybrid differences that can occur uh, among all the hybrids growing out in, in the state. That's why I wanted to interrupt you. I know it's a significant uh, item. So thank you for the thorough reply. All right, so as far as the normal pattern of corn forage and grain development, uh, corn has got what we call a double peak for quality. We've got one peak right around flowering, which is a silking stage, which is this R1 stage here. It then, like all other forages, goes downhill in terms of milk per ton. But then beginning about the uh, dough and milk and dough stages, we actually increase our quality so that by the time we hit that half milk line stage, we're at a second quality peak, largely due to the effect of the grain that's coming on and developing later on. If we look at the, the quality of the stover, the leaves and the stalks of the plant, in other words, the digestible uh, energy fiber energy uh, NDFD uh, that's basically at its best early and then it slowly decreases uh, over time and uh, you lose about 15 to 20 percent of your quality uh, as that crop matures within the within the stover portion what's really changing though is the grain yield and that grain yield is really coming on it shows kind of an s curve there's about a 40 to 45 day period where where uh, 
the kernels are filling, and that really is what's changing that quality for that second peak. So that milk per acre is really um, at its peak on that, on that second peak. The two things I wanna concentrate here though are what's happening with moisture. And if you go to this half milk line stage, you can see that there's about a, almost a, you know, a 20 to 25 point swing in terms of the moisture of the grain versus the moisture of the stover or the, or the, or the forage. And this is important and we can use that as we move into uh, the actual harvest of the, of the corn silage because the grain is gonna be drier than the stover or the stock. But everything really depends on how successful the pollination was. If it's poor, you can harvest any time. If it's fair, which is oftentimes what goes into corn silage, uh, you can leave it for silage. And if it's good, you can do whatever you want, normal management, either silage or snaplage or grain or whatever. But the decision as to when to harvest that crop really depends upon the success of that, of that pollination. So there are a few things to, uh, again, I mentioned that you can adjust in field the moisture of the silage being cut and then being put into a bunker by just raising and lowering the cutter, cutter bar. And here you can see along the bottom here, the cutting height in inches uh, at 6, 12, and 18. Six would be kind of the normal, normal height. And silage yield goes down. It goes down about 15% by raising that cutter bar, you know, about, about a foot or so. Uh, but what happens is, is you in, improve the milk per ton because you're leaving the poorest part of the plant, if you will, out there in the field. So if you've got adequate forage and, and, um, and you, you don't need the forage necessarily to help with soil erosion and some of the other things that go on uh, with uh, after a corn silage crop, one of the things you can do is leave a little higher stubble you're actually harvesting a better quality crop out there. And when you multiply the two together, you only lose about four to 5% of your milk per acre. Again, because you're losing the, leaving the poorest part of the plant in terms of quality out there in the field. The real thing though, is what's happening to moisture. And again, most of the moisture in corn is really in the lower part of the stock, right next to where the roots are taken up water and that sort of thing. And as you raise that cutter bar, you actually dry down the crop because the grain portion of that crop is a lot drier than the, the stover portion uh, of that crop. And so this becomes a, a, a technique or a tool we can use out there in the field, especially since a lot of these choppers now have, have uh, shoot NIR machines on them that can measure moisture. NIR is very good at measuring moisture. And, um, and that's a, a, a very easy thing to do and adjust as you're going to the field. And you can, you can adjust it basically, like I say, about three to four uh, moisture points. We mentioned that, that uh, we use this half a percent milk dry down per day. And this is some old data, but we, it's kind of been verified in, in a number of uh, places, but this is some data Scott Hendrickson collected over six years uh, back when we started this program a little bit and basically looked at, he went back to the same spots in the field and basically measured the moisture of those, of those areas. And um, in 1996, this slope was 0.4% per day. 1997 was 0 0.6, 1998 it was 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0.4. And so this is kind of where this half a percent dry down per day value comes from. Some years it's faster than others. Obviously, when you have a drought out there, it'll be a faster dry down typically than something that is, that is a little wetter. Um, but in general, you can see that it's a fairly uh, consistent dry down pattern of about a half a percent a day. A day. Sometimes you'll get rains that'll raise it up a little bit again. Uh, but again, you have this overall pattern that's going on and this half a percent per day is, gives you a rough idea of when you're going to be, how far out you are yet from uh, when that crop will be uh, available for, for chopping. But there is a lot of infield variability that can occur as well. 
Um, this is some, a knoll and a swale that we had at Arlington. And we had a number of rainfall events that occurred during that time. We had 2.1 inches on September 13th in this particular year. And you can see what happened on the knoll. Uh, there was a lot of water uptake on that knoll um, where you know that the moisture really was brought up quite a bit uh, with that rainfall event, it, also in the swale a little bit. But again, overall, this pattern of about a half a percent per day is occurring. But there are some things that obviously a dry period or, or significant rainfall event can rehydrate that corn out there a little bit. Um, uh, and again, a way to do that, to adjust that in field is to raise and lower that cutter bar. So one of the things that we're really encountering this year a lot is this uneven crop that we've got. And there's two kinds of unevenness in the field. One is just uneven spacing. But when we look at yield and, and silage yield and quality, green and versus green yield, there's really not a lot of effect going on with spacing. It has to be pretty bad out there before you really start to affect green yield in terms of spacing. What really affects uh, yield is uneven emergence, where you have a whole bunch of these runts that are out there in the field and um, just how, what, how they influence yield. And there's been published literature that's shown you know, 10 to 20% yield impact when up to one third of the plants are just two weeks later um, uh, in the field. And so this, the uneven emergence is really what impacts yield more than, more than the uneven spacing. Now, how much these runts contribute to overall yield in terms of silage is a little bit difficult to, um, to ascertain sometimes. Obviously, the more runts you got, the more likely you're going to be affecting the overall yield. But if it's just a few scattered runts out there, you may not affect yield all that much. I also mentioned that, uh, you know, this idea of stress and that goes on this year, of course, we're going through a lot of stress with pollination, um, especially fields that were on lighter soils that followed cover crops or that were oftentimes planted late. And the reason we have some uh, difficult issues going on is what we call the NIC. During normal pollination, it's usually about an eight to nine day period where the pollen is shed and the silks emerge about one or two days after the pollen starts to drop from the anthers in the tassel. And so you have an overlap period of about seven to eight days or so. When you've got a drought, this nick becomes shortened. The anthers drop pollen earlier and the silks are delayed in their emergence so that the overall nick is only you know, three to four days versus nine to 10 days. And again, management decisions depend upon the success of this corn pollination. And I, I know that we got some timely rains this year, but there are still quite a few fields that have some issues with corn uh, pollination uh, going on out there. So again, just something to think about. Again, the silage dry down days, I just really encourage farmers and, and agents and co-op people to, uh, to do these sort of things because it helps um, determine and this, this critical part of corn silage management in timing the harvest and being able to get at the right moisture for fermentation, preservation, and, and in siling. And this, I just really encourage this. And I know Kevin's doing one in Autogamy County. There's a lot of agents and, and uh, people doing um, these dry down days around the state and uh, definitely worthwhile to participate in these. One of the things though that uh, there's been some discussion about is, is just how many plants do you need and how many different parts of the field do you need to really sample things? And I don't know how many parts of the field you need. You need to try to pick something that's representative obviously for that field. But one of the things about corn, especially hybrids is, is the unique, uh, uh, as one, one unique aspect of this crop is that they're all similar. All the plants out there are basically the same kind of plant genetically. And so what you're dealing with oftentimes is the, uh, the environment or the, the soil water content, you know, things like that. But every, every plant is basically unique genetically 
And because of that, oftentimes you really don't need to take a lot of plants. And really the objective of these dry down days is to look at what's changing within the field. So all you really need, I think, is maybe one or two plant sites, locations in the field that represent your field. And then the key is, is to go back to those same sites every time you do one of these dry downs. And the number of plants you take um, is, um, you know, I think three to five plants is, is adequate. Here's some data that we, we just, we, the experiment was basically to take one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128 plants. And as we got into harvesting this, we became really quickly obvious that 64 and 128 plants, if we try to do that on a crew, I wouldn't have a crew to be able to uh, harvest corn silage. But it didn't matter anyway, because what we saw was that by the time we had four plants out there, as far as the yield was concerned, it was pretty much reflecting what 32 plants uh, was, was, was reflecting. In other words, we were getting about a half to, uh, a half to six tenths of a pound of dry matter per plant uh, out there uh, with, with that. But the key is the, the error that's associated with that. And really, again, once we get in this five to 10 pound range, five to 10 plant range, the error is pretty much the same. But even this high error here is really not all that much. It's, it's two one hundredths of a plus or minus two one hundredths of a difference among the plants. And uh, that isn't a lot of difference. So again, I think a lot of guys bring in three to five plants and I think that's adequate. As far as the effect on moisture, the same sort of a thing, um, same sort of an approach here. Uh, basically, moisture was pretty much the same for this part of the field, ranging from about 64 to 66 percent moisture, and or 67 percent, an average of around 66 percent. Pretty reflective whether you brought in one or 32 plants, and the standard error was about plus or minus one to two points there. So again, three to five plants is really all you need. The key is going back to the same site, the same location, uh, every time you take a silage dry down to look at the difference or the change that's going on within that field. So to kind of wrap this part up, um, as far as uh, harvesting, one of the things is, is you know, just get a good packing, good seal. Uh, Brian Holmes has had a lot of work that was done through the years to try to get at that a little bit know that you're gonna have about a 15% in the best conditions, about a 15% shrink that goes on with storing uh, corn silage in a, in a pile. And this is something that really is unavoidable, uh, but um, you can minimize that by, uh, again, harvesting at the correct moisture, getting good compaction or uh, packing that, that uh, bunker well, and then covering it as quickly as you can. The other issue that comes up a lot is uh, nitrates and kind of where they're located. Uh, if we look at the leaves versus the ear versus the uh, upper and middle and lower stalk, most of those nitrates are in that lower part of the plant. And a good plant indicator for if you have might have high nitrates is if you see a lot of little leaves or little tillers growing at the base of the plant. And this is true for all gr grass plants. Um, Usually when a structure is getting ready to grow, basically it's concentrating proteins and amino acids and nitrates in that, in that portion of the plant where it's trying to grow. And with grass, it's in that lower part of the stem. And so typically you'll see high nitrate concentrations in the lower part of the stock uh, when there is, a, when there is a, some stress going on out there. But just the fermentation and siling process will oftentimes reduce the amount of nitrates that, that are out there. If there's still concern, you can send it into a forage testing lab. And if you are looking at um, moving some cows, you could feed some to a few uh, cow calls to see if there's any issues that might, might arise. But again, the way you can kind of tell this is new growth at the base of the plant. And generally with a corn crop that's fairly well eared out and uh, fairly, fairly high yield, you really don't need to worry about it because all the nitrogen and fertilizer that was put onto that field is distributed now throughout the plant. And, and again, you really don't need to worry too much about it. 
one of the things that uh, we have to wrestle with this year is that is that the value of the corn silage or some of these fields uh, might be atypical for what we typically have experienced in the past. One of the things that we've done in our corn silage program is since 1997 is every management plot that we do, we harvest that crop, for, we harvest that plot for silage, and then we leave four rows and come back and harvest that plot for grain. So we know exactly the silage or uh, forage to grain yield uh, relationship that uh, is out there. And we've done this for a number of experiments, hybrids, plant density, data planning, row spacing, a, a lot of different things where we've used this paired plot approach where we harvest silage and then come back for, for uh, grain yield. And, um, and so we have rep data based on yield and quality. So we can use this then to get at uh, what, what's called the grain equivalence in a ton of silage. Uh, because a lot of times uh, when contracts are written, written, some sort of a ratio or grain equivalent is used for every ton of silage that's, that's delivered. We know this relationship pretty well. And in fact, this was uh, kind of uh, talked about in 1972 by Neil Jorgensen and Crawley, where uh, for various grain yield levels, you had basically this amount of dry grain within that ton of silage. And the range at that time in the 1970s was about five bushels to seven bushels per ton of silage. And this relationship look, looks something like this, okay? It's kind of curvilinear. And um, once you get to a certain grain yield level, it doesn't really go up that more, much more. Well, we're much higher than that right now. And um, there's a lot of different issues that go on between a seller and a buyer in terms of what they're looking for in terms of buying some of these fields that are, that are out there. Uh, for a seller, really forage yield and milk per acre are the best way to determine the value and the cost of production. But for a dairyman, he's interested in quality, should be interested in the quality of that corn silage. And I always say with BMR corn, that's probably the best quality corn that we've got out there. Buy all the corn, BMR corn you can. I don't know if I'd grow it though on your farm because you do take a yield hit that goes on. Relative to other forages, corn uh, silage is higher yield, less labor to produce. A lot, of other, a lot of these characteristics from a dairyman, there's a lot of energy in this. Uh, it's also a way to get rid of some of the manure that's out there. There are differences between uh, grain and silage hybrids. I mentioned the BMR corn versus grain. Uh, and there are differences in terms of uh, overall grain production, but um, the seller's got to, producer's got to uh, consider some of that stuff. And then on the, on the buyer side or the dairyman side, uh, there are some animal performance differences with different types as well. There are differences for uh, producing the crop. There's a, there's a nutrient removal effect that goes on with silage. Uh, grain, you got trucking silage, you got uh, harvesting and shrink loss that goes on uh, within, within, um, within, within, the, uh, within the bunker. So if we look at what's been happening then, um, uh, these are the old grain yield uh, levels, and this was the Crowley and, and uh, Jorgensen levels that were, that were used at that time. I did some work in, 19, in 2016 where basically I looked at the forage yields of these different ye grain yield levels and then recalculated the grain equivalents. And for a 200 bushel yield, typically we're at about 8.2 grain equivalents per ton of silage. In other words, 8.2 bushels of dry grain per ton of uh, corn silage at 65% moisture, okay? And uh, so that's kind of what a lot of people are using, but there's actually a better way that might be able to get at some of these problem fields where they're very uneven and where they're um, uh, lay planted or, you know, the kind of typical for what goes into a, corn silage pile. And that is using starch content and back calculating the grain equivalents. Okay, and we can, so if we know the starch content, we can back calculate the grain equivalents. There's gotta be a bias or difference that, that's used. 
and up around the 200 bushel yield level, it's about 1.4 bushels per, per ton of silage. But we're able to basically, if you know the quality of the corn silage, back calculate the uh, grain equivalents of that field that's coming off, uh, coming off the um, uh, for, for corn silage quality. So just to give you an example of this a little bit here, this is some data, uh, six hybrids planted at three, uh, over three years at a number of locations. The average grain equivalents range from about uh, 6.7 at Rhinelander to 8.3 at Lancaster. But you can see the huge difference depending upon hybrid, 3.8 uh, bushels per ton of silage all the way up to 10.5 bushels per ton of silage. This is a huge problem when you're basing a contract on 8.2 um, bushels per ton of silage, for example. That's a huge range that goes on that the dairyman is oftentimes being paid for, paying for, and especially when you get to some of these challenging fields. So again, you can back, using our data, we can go and back calculate this a little bit. Again, for Arlington and th this particular data site, the grain yield range from 148 bushels to 209 bushels. If we use a grain equivalent of 8.2 bushels per ton of silage, which is typical for grain for, for forage contracts. Um, uh, and, and again, we're kind of back calculating this a little bit. Um, you can see that it ranges from about 172 to 234 bushels. And it's about a 20 bushel difference between what we actually measured versus what we'd calculate using 8.2. If we'd use that curvilinear relationship that's in there, in other words, when we have low yields, it's a little bit lower equivalent and high yield is a little higher equivalent, we could get to within 16 bushels of what we actually measured. But when we back calculated using the starch equivalents, again, individual locations might be a little bit off, but overall, we're basically dead on in terms of being able to back calculate uh, the true value of that grain yield in there versus a field that might be all over the board in terms of their development. Just some thoughts um, on this. Right now, we're right here. Most people just use about eight or 8.2 bushels per ton of silage, but there are other approaches that might get at this a little more accurately. All right, so to sort of kind of wrap up here, uh, again, noting hybrid maturity and planting date is important, tasseling, silking date, and then assuming 42 to 47 days after silking. As that milk line moves, uh, use a half a percent dry down per day, and raising that cutter bar can oftentimes move that moisture two to four points uh, within the uh, within uh, within the field. So with that, I'll I'll stop. And I don't know if we got time for any questions, but while Brian's getting set up, um, maybe uh, I can deal with a few. <clears throat> All right, we'll have you stop share, Joe. Perfect. And there are no new additional questions that ended up in the chat. However, uh, thanks to Jerry Clark, he did post uh, your website link, Joe, so everybody can uh, visit your uh, location there for additional information. So with that, now we're going to hear from Dr. Brian Luck. Biolog Actually, Joe, just want to say thank you for your time and expertise today before we move on to Brian. Uh, and there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. So if some of you think of a question for Joe and are still around after uh, we're finished here with uh, Brian's talk, please, this is the time to ask those things. Don't go, don't leave today without getting an answer to a question, no matter uh, what you think. So. Dr. Brian Luck, Biological Systems Engineer, UW-Madison and Division of Extension. He's going to speak to us today about forage harvester setup for corn silage. Brian, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay, yeah? We're good. You're coming through fine. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so Jerry and this group asked me to talk about forage harvester setup and some things we've been doing in the lab with uh, with the harvesters for corn silage. So we'll start off. Um, Joe talked about this a little bit, so I'm not gonna spend hardly any time on the crop. He did such a good job. Um, but just a couple of things we're thinking about, you know, we had a dry year, there's a variability uh, within our corn silage crop. So maturity and height, 
Um, and then the other question I have from a machinery standpoint is what's the field conditions going to look like at harvest? You know, if we if we continue on the same trend we've been in during this um, during this growing season, obviously we're going to be dry and have no issues. Um, but if things decide to change, which I, I have a hard time predicting the weather, as do people that do it for a living, um, you know, if we have wet conditions, that'll that'll change uh, change our harvest process a little bit and change our thinking too. So just some considerations there. Um, in addition, you know, if we get into that wet situation, we wind up with uh, extra machinery out there and then maybe soil conditions that we have to repair uh, for the next spring planting as well. So just some things to think about as we go in. I'm going to do a little bit of a shameless plug here at the beginning. Um, I worked with Hordes Dairyman uh, and Hay and Forage Grower. I don't know if I'm on the screen or not, but uh, we got a book out that's all about corn silage. Um, some recognizable names as far as authors in there. Uh, so if you want some of this information in, in quite a bit more detail, um, I'd, I'd go take a look at that book and I'm pulling some of the stuff I'll talk about today uh, from what's written in there as well. So uh, easy Google search, or if you have trouble finding it, um, holler at me and I can send you the link. So I have to give credit to uh, CNH Global out of, in, in New Holland, Pennsylvania for this photo rendering of the inside of a forage chopper. Uh, but from a, from a machinery standpoint, I love these pictures and engineering as well, just gives us a good idea of what's going on in there and, and how, the, uh, how this monster works. So usually if I was in person, I would ask the crowd to rattle off uh, the different parts and pieces and how they work. But since we're in a Zoom setting, I'll just take my time here and go through them a little bit. I, uh, for those of you that are engine nerds, I apologize for cutting off the engine in the back there where you can't see it too well. But um, the one thing that's not on these photos is the header. And obviously, you know, we call them cutter bar header, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. But um, that obviously cuts the crop down and then orients it in a uh, fashion to where it's ready to be chopped. Uh, moving back from the header, we have feed rolls. Um, usually the bottom feed roll is stationary uh, while the top feed roll is on springs there. You can see that to adjust for the different mat thickness or yield or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, and that top one moves and it applies some spring pressure to the mat as well uh, to try to compress the corn material uh, to make it easier and we so we can do a better job of cutting that material when it gets back to uh, the cutter head. Usually there's two sets of feed rolls and I, if you look closely I think they're they're shown there uh, one behind the, the the big ones up front and and those secondary feed rolls usually are metering feed rolls um, that make sure the crop's going into the cutter head at the right rate so that we get our theoretical length of cut that we're looking for. Um, one thing I will mention while we're talking about feed rolls, when we do talk about um, yield monitors on forage harvesters, they are usually set up um, to be to measure feed roll displacement. So how far up that top roll will move uh, as it's feeding the material into the machine uh, gives you a pretty good correlation um, to the amount of material going through machine and yield. Uh, that works pretty well in corn silage usually because we we usually fill the entire width of that feed roll. Uh, but when we're talking about forages like hay, alfalfa, etc., uh, grasses that can be a little more, for lack of a better word, clumpy, um, we're we're kind of looking at a data set that's not exactly representative of what uh, what we have out there because big soccer ball pieces can go through and bump that feed roll open, but we didn't really have the whole throat filled. Um, and that's where we get some erroneous data. Moving back from the feed rolls, we have the shear bar and the cutter head. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, one thing that's not pictured here, but is pictured in the next slide that I'll move on from is uh, kernel processing rolls. Uh, so those are behind the cutter head in this slide. Um, and then you have your blower fan out to the spout. So one of the things I kind of, uh, uh, everybody pretty well knows this about me now, but I moved up here from the South and we, I didn't work with dairy very much down there. 
but I'm I'm continually fascinated how impressive and simple these machines are to harvest corn silage. There's compared to a combine, there's really just not much to this machine, um, and the power required to run it is quite a bit more as well. But it's it's pretty impressive that we can take all of that corn twelve up to twelve rows or more. Um, and chop it into three quarter inch pieces, crush every kernel and and have it ready to be ensiled, which is, I don't know, I'm a big fan of forage harvesters. They're, they're nice to, nice to work with. So Joe spent some time on this and, and I knew he would. So I decided to put one slide in um, just as far as the machinery management side of things. Um, you know, you can, you can adjust this on the fly, like Joe mentioned. So being able to do the height of cut, um, depending on your moisture, other things. Uh, but it's one of those sort of easy solutions as we go along through the field and we have an area that's, you know, better, different, whatever we decide, we produce higher quality silage when we raise it up. So just one of the things to think about if you're going or having a chopper go through the field or operating your own machine, um, raising that height of cut can give you some benefit as far as quality of silage also leaves that residue in the field, um, leaves nitrates in the field as well, which can help. And then, um, you know, maybe we're preventing a little soil erosion as well if we leave some extra, extra corn stalk out there. So I don't pretend to be a nutritionist, so I'm not going to talk to you about what length of cut, theoretical length of cut you need to run. Um, general, you know, kind of coming from my, from my Bible here, the you know, we're looking at three quarter to three quarter of an inch and longer uh, these days is kind of where we're at. And I'll leave that to the nut nutritionist to explain why. Um, what I will talk to you about is the is how the theoretical length of cut is determined and sort of control we have. So you have feed roll speed in the front, as well as the number of cutter head knives on the drum on the cutter head. And then you can also control the cutter head speed. Some of the modern machines Every bit of this is done from the cab. Um, others may be mechanical adjustments outside of the machine, uh, but a lot of them you can adjust all three of these. So as that material comes in, we call it a theoretical length of cut because we can't guarantee that everything is in a straight line moving through the machine. Um, so we'll, we'll get some pieces that are longer and shorter, but in general, um, every time that knife passes the cutter bar, uh, basically, we are looking to push that material in a certain amount of distance and cut it off and move it through the machine from there. Um, if you look at the knives on the on the chopper, on the cutter head, um, one thing to note is they are kind of on an angle. Um, when we talk about cutting or shearing material, if we were to do that with straight knives, straight horizontally across the cutter bar, what winds up happening is we're pushing a larger surface area. Um, and it makes the power requirement go way up. So one of the sort of, again, nerdy engineering things that I like to talk about is, you know, if we put those knives on an angle at any one time, there's only one point of that knife uh, interacting with the cutter bar and cutting the material. And as it moves through, it's pushing down on a single point, going back and forth across that cutter bar. And that reduces the horsepower requirement uh, to be able to cut that much material. Thought I'd spend a little time on sort of each of these little pieces to talk about maintenance, maintenance and machine adjustment. I'll preface every bit of what I say here um, by saying that always refer to your operator's manual. Every machine's a little bit different. They're all very similar also. Um, but one of the things that we do generally, I think on a daily basis is knife sharpening. A lot of the newer machines, self-propelled machines, um, they actually have built-in grinding stones to sharpen the knives um, from the cab, basically. Uh, so you can you can do that, hit a button, go through a sharpening process. Um, and then there's another thing that I read about recently. Um, if you've seen some of the knife sharpness testers, it's a standardized piece of material on a scale and you kind of push your knife down into it and it'll tell you how many grams of force it took to cut that standard piece of material somebody came up with something like that for forage harvesters as well. So you can walk in um, and push the push the device into the knife and it'll cut the little piece of string or fishing line or whatever it winds up being um, and get a number associated with your knife sharpness, depending on how sharp you want your knives to be to go through the uh, go through the material. So the reason we want the knife sharp 
kind of a no crap statement here, but I will say it just to be uh, just to be complete is quality of cut. So we aren't tearing material uh, at the shear bar with the knives and maintaining that theoretical length of cut as best we can and cutting through through the material properly. Another maintenance and machine adjustment is feed roller tension. Um, those those springs are adjustable um, from the outside. You have to have a big wrench to do it, I believe. But being able to compress that mat um, to the point that it makes it a, a more of a solid instead of fluffy type material that we're trying to cut is a good thing. Um, so making sure your feed roller tension is set correctly, uh, not so tight that it makes it hard to feed, but tight enough that we're compressing it and getting a good cut. Something that a lot of people don't think about is the shear bar in there, the shear bar maintenance and clearance. So when you install the shear bar into the machine, and again, everyone's different and I haven't actually interacted with the, with the shear bar very much personally, but what you want is a, is a horizontal and a vertical 90 degree sharp corner there that the knives interact with and the material interacts with, and that allows knife to cut a lot more cleanly. Um, over time, even though that is a kind of steel that is highly wear resistant and probably hardened and tempered and expensive as all get out to buy, um, they will wear out. And one of the things that you'll start to notice is <clears throat> when you get a rolled edge on that shear bar, not only do you not have a good sharp edge to cut against, <clears throat> but you're increasing the gap between the knife and the shear bar. And you want that gap between the knife and the shear bar to be within the tolerance that the manufacturer recommends. I want to say really small, but there may be a tolerance plus or minus however many thousandths of an inch um, to make sure that your interaction shear bar and knife are interacting properly and cutting the material you want them the way you want them to. So in between wear on the shear bar due to the material and the cutting process and knife sharpening on a regular basis, um, you wind up increasing that gap and can get a bad cut quality uh, pretty quickly if you're not careful. So paying attention to that gap there uh, will maintain your um, cut quality throughout the harvest process. So something that I've worked with, you know, quite a bit here, and I'll, I'll, I won't spend as much time on some other things um, that I usually talk about, but kernel processing rollers. Um, I don't know very many people that aren't running these these days. A lot. I actually went and reviewed some of uh, some of the stuff on Team Forage website when we talk about um, forage harvesters. And you know, at the point when Dr. Schuler, which was quite a few years, there was a gap between him and and when I was hired. Um, some of the things he was talking about is why we want to use a kernel processing roller. Um, I don't think that's any gee whiz. Now we want to reduce the size of those kernels, make that starch more available in the rumen. Um, something to keep in mind too is a lot of things, a lot of people, at least I did, and initially think about the kernel processing roller as just crushing the material, uh, but you also have the capability to control roller differential speed. So they, they rotate opposing directions to feed the material through. Um, you adjust the gap between the rollers depending on what you're using. I'm not going to get into um, the virtues or problems with shredlage. I'll leave that to the nutritionist as well. Regardless, um, they do crush the material. So all that material is getting pushed through a one millimeter, usually or less. I've heard of people running at 0.75 millimeters now, um, just barely any clearance between those rollers. And then also they have a speed differential. So they rotate at different speeds. So not only do we get a crushing action, but we get a bit of a shearing action between those rollers as well uh, to be able to make the um, to make the corn kernels smaller particle size. I put in here smaller gap within between those rollers generally means smaller particle size. Um, depending on your yield and how much material you're passing through there, I've actually I've published a study uh, that kind of made us scratch our heads a little bit that we had a one millimeter gap versus a two, three, and four millimeter gap. Um, and the two millimeter gap was actually the smaller overall particle size uh, compared to the one. And again, we were, you know, you always think everything made of steel is completely rigid, but it's not. And as we were shoving a high yield portion of the field through those one millimeter gap or smaller, the, uh, the rollers are actually deflecting just a little bit, um, making it more like a two millimeter gap or more. 
Um, so one of the things to think about when you're running a kernel processor in your forage harvester is quite a bit of the engine horsepower that you're generating driving through the field is going to run in those kernel processors. And, you know, there's, there's some you, uh, utilized to move the machine, some utilized to feed roll header, cutter bar, et cetera. But the, the vast majority is running that kernel processor. If you can open that gap up just a little bit and achieve the same result, i.e. not get deflection and not put your energy into moving material and deflecting the parts, um, you're probably going to be more efficient and better off in the end as far as feed quality. So, so just something to keep in mind. Um, there's no real indicator or anything to know when or how. Basically, what you need to do is run it at the 0.75, one millimeter, one and a half millimeter, two for short sections and test your kernel processing score um, at those different settings and be able to understand, you know, what kind of job those rollers are doing. Um, but I would highly recommend doing that uh, because I think the fuel savings running at a two millimeter gap versus a 0.75 if you're getting the same material out the backside as far as kernel processing goes um, can save quite a bit of money as far as efficiency goes. So we did talk about this a little bit and I won't spend too much time here, but again, smaller particle size means increased surface area. Increased surface area means more places for enzymatic hydrolysis to occur in the rumen, which makes that uh, makes us more milk. And this is how we usually check it. Um, there's, there's several other ways um, out there, but sieving method takes forever. You have to dry the material. A lot of people use the Penn State separator there. Um, and the thing, a lot of you've heard me talk about this before, but the thing that bothered me when I arrived in Wisconsin is the quickest way to check and the way most people were using was uh, the cups that I'm showing there at the right. Take a one liter cup of corn silage, dump it out on the tailgate and go, yep, that looks okay. Um, so being an engineer, I want to put a number on it. So I'm going to remind you about our corn silage image processing app. It's silage snap, um, free to use, free to access on Android and Apple still. I did double check that last night. They're still up and still functional. Um, there's the Google Play and the App Store preview on both of those. What you need is a, a dark background and a coin, US coin or a euro, one euro piece uh, is what we put in there. Had quite a few requests from uh, Chile and other places to insert their uh, their coins as well. And I was like, nah, y'all just have to get it, it too much effort. Um, maybe we convert it to a standard size circle or something at some point. But uh, basically you collect a sample, you have to water separate it, uh, spread the kernels out on a back background and then place the coin in the center of the image and take a picture. I get a giggle out of this. Usually I worked with a company out of Maryland um, that obviously had zero agricultural background. And they created my first version of my home screen there um, with a corn silage app. And looks to me like they put wheat as the background. So we had to do a little talking to them and get that corrected to, to something like corn, uh, which makes a lot more sense. Uh, but anyway, long story short, there's the app, and then there's sort of the results that you can get um, when you take the picture. Again, what we took a picture of there was uh, six millimeter airsoft pellets, um, which are very uniform, as a matter of fact. But as you can tell, too, if you look in that image, it's picking up very small little pieces um, within the image processing algorithm uh, that it's including in the analysis as well. So it's pretty sensitive. Uh, laboratory type tool that you can carry around in your pocket, which I think is really, really cool. Few examples of some bad images, just making sure that you understand, you know, you want a good, clear image. Um, and if you look at some of these here, you know, there's there's places where it's creating two, one particle out of two particles and other things like that. Um, and then a shiny background, it doesn't like it all. If you look at the top of that image, um, you wind up seeing areas that it detected as particles that were just glare uh, off of the black trash bag that we tried to take the picture on. So construction paper in my mind is best uh, when you're using it. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about sort of the next steps. We worked with the company to try to get this on, um, on a forage harvester to run in real time. And we're able to do it, which I think is just fun. Um, so 
I asked my student to figure out if we could take a picture at the velocity um, that corn silage moves through a forage harvester. And if you didn't know in the spout, when the fan picks up the corn silage and blows it through the spout, on average, um, the material is moving approximately, approximately 90 miles an hour. Um, so can you take a picture of something that's right next to you uh, moving at 90 miles an hour without it being a blurry mess? Uh, so my student built a potato gun, basically. So compressed air, um, muzzle loaded, in case you were wondering, not breech loaded, but muzzle loaded. Uh, so he pushed the, pushed the material down um, behind, for lack of a better word, a, a foam wad uh, that he taped a washer to. So basically as inductive sensors at the end, and he can measure how fast that washer passes those and, and measure exactly how fast that material was moving going through the tube. And he was able to acquire an image at 90 miles an hour. Little blurry, um, not, not the best image we've ever seen, I'm sure, uh, but it is an image that we were able to collect and they were able to get better as, as time went on, cameras changed a little bit. So we slapped the camera on the on the forage harvester and harvested silage. And that's what the image sort of looks like as it's moving through the forage harvester. So now we can start to see pieces of kernels in the image um, and understand maybe that we could take a picture and kind of get at kernel processing score on the, on the fly. I put this in here just real quick to show you that, you know, the accuracy, precision, and recall, you want to be as close to one as possible, and the loss, you want to be as small as possible. And all of these different machine learning algorithms that we used um, were, were achieving that, but my student went through and did a analysis on the best one, chose it. Um, we did compare to actual kernel processing score that we were able to do in the lab, so just the sieve separation as well. Um, so basically, we were able to show that we used quite a few image images. Um, if you look at the number of images we collected there, the the farmer we were working with was running at a 1.5 millimeter gap on his kernel processor, so we were able to get quite a few more images there. There, excuse me. Um, but as we went along, we were able to to come up with a kernel processing score number based on the images we got off the forage harvester. Uh, did a little calibration here. So the left graph shows kernel processing score, uh, number, number of kernels per image uh, that we did manually to train the algorithm. And then same thing on the right, the algorithm, algorithm grouped uh, the data into the kernel processing score there uh, to be able to, to teach itself which, which, how many kernels, whole kernels do I see that correlates to X um, kernel processing score. Brian, I just want to let you know we're at 133. So I guess uh, certainly we want everybody to get the information you have, but uh, uh, just uh, know that that's where we're at. No problem, Kevin. I'm down to the last two or three slides. So I'll be finished here very close, very quickly. Uh, to wrap this up, we were able to do it. So the image analysis versus Civ uh, matched up really well uh, with a pretty small error band there. So now we can do um, generally do kernel processing score on the fly with uh, image analysis on the chopper. So last, last couple of slides here, I'll be really quick um, talking about check the kernel processing score often, uh, train people involved, even drivers of the trucks. I know a lot of that material ends up on the hood of the truck. Take a look how many whole kernels are you seeing, uh, making sure you're maintaining the processor, adjust them often, check them often, and then replace those worn, or worn out rolls uh, to make sure you're getting enough kernel processing to make good quality feed. I would be remiss not to mention safety during corn silage harvest as I've gotten to attend a lot of uh, different events on the agribility side of things. Um, heavy machinery moving quickly is always dangerous. So head on a swivel, communication is key. Make sure you have a way of communicating with people close to you as well as in other vehicles radios, cell phones. On my farm, my dad whistled at me really loud and I learned how to do that back at him. Uh, high visibility clothing is always good. Uh, and then watch out for each other during harvest. Make sure you're not going into, uh, into the path of a forage harvester to uh, take a bio break or anything and that operator doesn't know you're there. That's a very dangerous situation to be in. 
Speaking of agribility, last slide here is uh, just if you know anybody with farm that farms with a disability, put them in touch with us. You know, we might be able to help them out and make life a little easier on them. And with that, I will wrap up here and take any questions if you have any. All right. I've been monitoring the chat and uh, Brian, you are so thorough that uh, nobody uh, put forth a question. Uh, are there any last questions for, for Joel Lauer? If not, we want to definitely thank you for uh, being here today. I'm going to have you stop share so I can share my screen here. And what we wanna do is let people know that uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the QR code that wasn't received uh, in time here today. So we're going to have to ask for people, if you would like to earn CCA credits, that you please enter your CCA number into the chat box. So that's necessary. And before you uh, all leave us today, we wanna remind you that Badger Crop Connect will be back. This is the last of our summer sessions. We're going to uh, switch to the fall and on September 13th, we will be back uh, with uh, new topics and speakers, those to be determined. So mark your calendars and we'll hopefully see many of you on August 30th at the Arlington Research Agronomy Field Day. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>